I have a deep voice. Good afternoon, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for, for joining us. And I'm here to open and deliver opening remarks at this expert workshop on the right to a healthy environment. Um, before I do so, I would like to introduce um, the uh, panel uh, or allow them at least to introduce themselves. I am great friends and colleagues with our illustrious Deputy Permanent Representative of Costa Rica to the United Nations, Anna Elena Campos. She is here to join us. Thank you so much. But if we could begin from this side. Thank you. I do? Okay. <laughs> well, there you go. Shows what I know. Um, so I'm Mark Lyman from the Universal Rights Group, which is a think tank based in Geneva, but we also have an office now in uh, Nairobi. And before that, I was a diplomat at the Human Rights Council, not for the UK, uh, but for the Maldives. And so I was involved in the first resolutions on human rights and climate change and human rights and environment and that this push for the right to health environment. In fact, I drafted many of the early resolutions on that so it's a very passionate subject for me i'm happy to be here thank you um so hi everyone my name is melina devona and i'm an attorney at earth rights advocacy based in nyu school of law um, we partnered with unep and with urg to work on analyzing and doing research on the right to health environment to further its implementation. So we have recently published a report, which I'll be pitching throughout the event, um, and it's online on different websites, and we are happy to share the link with you after. Thank you. Um, well, uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Sui Young Wang. I'm a legal officer in the law division of UNEP, and I'm very happy to be here, especially with all these uh, colleagues that we've been working together with for so many years. So we also like uh, organize a lot of meetings in Geneva and also in New York for the push for the global recognition of the right to the environment. And also together with the, the lead, uh, one of the lead countries for the resolution, Costa Rica. So looking forward to the discussions today. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, on behalf of uh, my country, Costa Rica. I am Ana Elena Campos, and I am DPR to UNEP and UN Habitat here in Nairobi. And um, as So Young mentioned, we have been uh, trying to work closely on, on the human right to a healthy environment for the last few years. And we're very proud of uh, everything that we have accomplished uh, globally so far, but we're looking forward to go beyond and uh, implement it even more. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Universal Rights Group and NYU for convening this important meeting. Uh, the timing could actually not be more significant. Uh, in two days, we will celebrate the one year you know, anniversary of the recognition of a human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment by UN General Assembly Resolution 76-300. This uh, recognition has already had several positive um, in, uh, impacts. The resolution is really changing the world and it has inspired and underpinned action by governments. It has also inspired and underpinned action by children and youth, by business, and of course, by environmental <coughs> defenders, which is very close to the hearts of us in the law division. Furthermore, it has led to more intergovernmental recognition. And in 2022, the government um, took another step forward by explicitly recognizing the right at the recently concluded climate and biodiversity conferences. The Kunming Montreal Protocol, <clears throat> sorry, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework demonstrates extensive integration of human rights into the world um, of the environment. It sets the world on a course to take a human rights-based approach in biodiversity-related actions. It recognizes the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities and the essential role of environmental human rights defenders in integrating this into specific targets of the biodiversity framework. Just last month, 
the Committee on the Rights of the Child committed to a new general comment on children's rights and the environment with a specific focus on climate change. The new general comment will guide states and other stakeholders in realizing children's right to a healthy environment in a more effective way. And of course, also through that, enhancing the health of children, which is so important. This is a huge achievement that would, this would have been almost impossible without a global recognition through the General Assembly of this right as a universal human right. Looking ahead, the next year and a half will be of vital importance for protection of the environment and for the implementation of the right to a healthy environment with several key and high level events taking place. Notably this year, we will have the SDG and climate summits taking place in September, the third session of the INC to develop an internationally legally binding instrument on plastic pollution that takes place here in Nairobi in November and COP28 taking place in Dubai in December, to which I understand over 60,000 people will attend, quite a significant event in the climate calendar. The sixth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly, which will take place in the last week of February next year, presents another opportunity to reinvigorate and strengthen commitments on environmental protection, including through human rights based approaches. Resolution 76300 recognizes specifically that environmental degradation and unsustainable development constitute some of the most pressing and serious threats to the ability of present and future generations, which are so important, to effectively enjoy all human rights. Therefore, it would be logical and important to ensure the environmental dimension in the consideration of the rights, interests, and needs of future generations in several processes underway, including in the Declaration on Future Generations and the Summit of the Future. Finally, the recognition of this human right is the result of relentless efforts by so many people, including those who are sitting with me today. Last week, a thrilling announcement was made. The Global Coalition of Civil Society Organizations, Indigenous Peoples, Social Movements and Local Communities for the Universal Protection of the Right to a Clean, Healthy and Sustainable Environment have played a key role in the recognition of the right and will be awarded the 2023 Human Rights Prize. The coalition is comprised of over 1,300 organizations around the globe truly a universal approach and a recognition for universal work. The coalition's recognition underscores that the triple planetary crisis is a concern we all share and the protection and the promotion of the right to a healthy environment are imperative for creating a better tomorrow for everyone, especially future generations. This prestigious prize established by the UN General Assembly represents a high UN recognition of human rights. UNEP remains dedicated in empowering those that are in vulnerable situations, including indigenous peoples, women, children and youth and environmental defenders. We also remain committed to advancing the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. And in this sense, there is, has been several commitments by our executive director to advancing this right, as well as other human rights related to the environment by supporting states, the private sector, civil society, other international organizations, UN specialized agencies, funds and programs, individuals, and other stakeholders. In conclusion, I want to say that this is a very, very important topic. Uh, the world is watching all of us as we seek to advance this very important human right so that it is firmly entrenched in the rights of customary international law. 
Thank you very much. And now I have to actually go back to the IPCC meetings downstairs. So I leave you in the very good hands of Su Yong and the other speakers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Stadler, and uh, and I really appreciate once again for everybody for coming here. This is a really busy time for everybody, and so we really appreciate taking the time to come here, and then also those who joined us online. So um, now I think we're about to we are uh, we can get started with the panel one. We'll be discussing uh, you know, the global recognition of the right to the environment. And how did we get here? So where is this coming from? And how did we get here? What process we've been through? So we have a, a really, really good variety of panel. So we have the, uh, we had the introduction of Mark and also Melina. And um, also uh, we had the uh, introduction of Anna. So we have a think tank representative and also the state representative, as well as uh, uh, the researcher who is working on the, on, uh, the implementation and the, and, uh, the development Amount of the right to health environment. And lastly, I just want to like quickly introduce so another like very important uh, speaker who is working on the, on the ground on the implementation of the right to health environment. So I'll just give the quick floor to the Griffins Oi Cheng. Thank you. Over to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Griffins uh, Cheng from Center for Environment, Justice and Development. Uh, we are based here in Nairobi. We're accredited to UNEP, and I'm also a steering committee member of International Pollutants Elimination Network, IPEN, uh, where I also co-chair the Toxics Plastic Working Group. So we are very engaged in the Basel, Rotterdam, Stockholm Convention, as well as Minamata, and the negotiation of the strategic approach to international chemicals management. So I will talk more uh, when my time comes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Griffins. So um, we'll start with the panel uh, presentations from uh, starting with Mark, and then after this uh, four panels uh, presentation, we'll open the floor for questions and comments also uh, from the floor here and also on the uh, participants online. So Mark, uh, I will invite you to the floor and uh, could you tell us about how, how we got, we got here? here? <laughs> That is challenging anyway, but in eight minutes, it's very challenging, especially because this presentation, the PowerPoint, when I originally did it, it was a 30 minute presentation. So I'll try and boil it down to eight uh, minutes. Uh, so this, I can, no. So I'll just tell you to do it. Okay, if we could go on to the, so yeah, the history, how did we get here? As I mentioned in my introduction, I was a diplomat at the time that this all started working for the Maldives. And then for the past 10 years with the Universal Rights Group. So along with So Young and John Knox and David Boyd and many other people, I've watched this kind of eyewitness account over the years. Um, the first thing to say is, you know, we don't often get excited at the United Nations, but we should in this case, because this was a really big deal. It's the, the UN recognition first by the Human Rights Council and then by the General Assembly of the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Um, was the first newly recognized universal standalone right since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. We did recognize another right, uh, the right to water and sanitation about 10 years previously, uh, but that was part of the right to an adequate standard of living. So the right to healthy environment, the first standalone new recognized universal right since basically the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War. Um, another, so big deal, but also it's not just the facts we recognize this right. This right, the right to healthy environment, really matters. Wherever it exists in the world, wherever it's recognized in national constitutions, in regional treaties, it really makes a difference for people's lives, for people's rights, and for the environment. And I'm sure Melina will talk about that or others will talk about it afterwards. Uh, increasingly, uh, it's being used in climate litigation, environment litigation, as a strong alternative just to just focusing on environmental law. Um, a few lessons, broad lessons, before I go into the detail. 
One is that it all took time, as everything at the United Nations, 15 years. Actually, it makes me feel old thinking that. Um, and the other key lesson, without going into too much detail, is, well, two big lessons. One is it shows the power of small states at the United Nations. Firstly, Maldives, back 15 to 10 years ago, uh, leading the first resolutions on human rights and climate change, human rights and environment. Uh, then Slovenia, then Switzerland, and then most recently, and perhaps most importantly, Costa Rica is with us on the panel that really led the charge uh, for final, the final stages of uh, on recognition at the Human Rights Council and then at the General Assembly. So we, when I will finish at 10 to, I'll try to. Um, yeah, the, the next one. So. The, the, the start of the story actually is that for a long time, uh, the United Nations really neglected uh, environmental issues, at least in the context of human rights. That's because the environmental movement didn't really get going until the 1960s. It explains why there's no mention of the right to healthy environment in the of human rights, because it wasn't uh, a big issue back then. The, the only really significant um, uh, contradiction to what I just said was the 1972 Stockholm Declaration on the Human Environment, which was actually incredibly progressive for its time, and it did talk about uh, the both aspects of man's environment, the natural and the man-made are essential to his well-being and the enjoyment of human rights, including the right to life itself. Um, but apart from that, we really didn't do very much. I mean, throughout the time of the Commission on Human Rights, which was the forerunner of the Human Rights Council, uh, there were a series of resolutions led by Costa Rica, Switzerland, and South Africa uh, on human rights and the environment, but they didn't, they weren't particularly progressive, and that wasn't the fault of Costa Rica or others. It's because a lot of big, powerful developing countries and developed countries didn't like to, this idea of linking human rights and the environment. Why? Well, in the case of Western countries, it was a especially because they were frightened about uh, environmental litigation. Um, and in the case of big emerging economies, developing countries, because they were worried that by linking human rights and environment, it would undermine their right to develop the idea that they wouldn't be able to build factories because that would violate human rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so things didn't really go very far until the establishment of the Human Rights Council in 2006. We could move on. Yeah. Um, and what the key, the key factor here was the Maldives and other small island developing states. And the key gripe for them, um, for us, because I was there at the time, was climate change and this lack of ambition on climate change. And so the small island developing states led by the Maldives, they wanted to show that climate change was not just a future issue, you know, some graph parts per million, environmental, meteorological, looking for, looking into the distant future. It was an immediate issue and it was a very human issue. It was having immediate and devastating human impacts around the world. And we decided as uh, small island states to use the human, international human rights framework to provide a lens to understand the human dimension of climate change and then to try to push countries around the world to take more ambitious climate action. Um, and a key, another key driver of that was uh, a case in the inter-American system uh, where um, a group of Inuits took the US to the inter-American uh, court for human rights damage caused by US greenhouse gas emissions. And they um, lost that for a number of reasons, but well, it was admiss admissible, but then they lost the case. Um, you know what, I don't, I don't think we have time to go into the detail, but anyway, it, they, the court said it was very difficult to prove causality between the emissions in a place like the United States and the human, that immediate human rights impacts on this, the Inuit in, um, in North America. Um, and so the small island states thought, well, this isn't fair because it should be possible to make that causal link. And so we embarked on this journey to link climate change and human rights. If you go to the next slide. 
Uh, well, I've mentioned that, so you can go to the next slide. So we organized the conference back in 2007, and that was me who organized it, so I really do feel old, um, on the human dimensions of climate change. Um, and as I said, the reason was to really bring the human face of this problem to the fore, so that in the UNFCCC, we could really push for more ambition. And if we go to the next slide, um, it ended with about 12 or 13 small island states adopting the Mali Declaration on the global dimensions of climate change, um, which for the first time said that climate change posed a direct and immediate threat to human rights around the world, and was also one of the first mentions of the universal right to a healthy environment. Um, you know, we're just gonna have to fly through these ones. Uh, the Maldives then brought all of this to the Human Rights Council and came forward with a number of resolutions on human rights and climate change, starting with resolution 7 23, which was significant because, again, it was adopted by consensus, notwithstanding very strong uh, opposition from the United States and Saudi Arabia and China and Brazil and countries like that. Um, and it, for the first time, said that climate change significantly harms human rights, especially people in vulnerable situations. Uh, next. And then we went to uh, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, drafted a report where they, you know, he elaborated on the climate impacts on human rights and made the case that the international human rights framework can be leveraged to strengthen the fight against climate change. Uh, we'll just, can we just go forward to, yeah, then there were some more resolutions, debates at the Human Rights Council, but then we need to go to the human rights and environment. One quick point here is that we also managed in the Human Rights Council to transmit the work done on human rights and climate change to the Conference of Parties of the UNFCCC, and that led to the first, for the first time ever, uh, human rights being explicitly mentioned in an international climate agreement, in this case, the Cancun agreements. Um, and the point there was, again, to use human rights to strengthen international climate policy. Uh, next. Okay, human rights and environment. Uh, carry on, please. Yeah. Um, so, then we switched tracks at the Human Rights Council. Uh, we didn't tell people at the time, but the goal was when we switched tracks to push eventually for a right to a healthy environment. Why did we not explicitly tell anyone? Well, because 10 years ago, there was enormous opposition from almost every country, uh, except small vulnerable states, to the right to a healthy environment, uh, which shows how far we have came. So what we needed to do to start with was to calm states down and to clarify what is the relationship between human rights and environment and environmental protection. Uh, and so we started with some soft resolutions. We asked for a report from the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And then we established a special procedure mandate, so a special rapporteur on human rights and environment. And it was his job, the first mandate holder was John Knox, who Sue Young worked with. And it was his job really to independently assess this relationship and put down on paper so that states would understand what the relationship is and what it isn't, and to use those reports to gradually make the case for universal recognition of the right to a healthy environment, so that next time there's a case like they knew it against the United States, we would be able potentially to win such a case uh, because we could include within the scope and content, which Melina will talk about, of the right to healthy environment, things like extraterritoriality. So, you know, actions in one country, you can prove that they lead to uh, causally lead to impact in another country. So if we go forward. Uh, so again, a series of resolutions at the Human Rights Council on Human Rights and Environment, move on, uh, establishing the Special Rapporteur in 2012. Um, and this eventually, by the time John Knox finished his six years as Special Rapporteur, I was in the meeting room when he did this, he announced that he thought it was time for the UN to recognize the right to a healthy environment. And he'd done such a good job, because especially because he used to work for the US government, the State Department, uh, in calming everybody down and really making the case that this was a good thing for all states, for the environment and for human rights. 
when he announced that it was time to recognize, um, I expected people in the audience to start throwing things at him, tomatoes, chairs, whatever. But actually he got a round of, it was his last meeting and he got a round of applause. And I thought, okay, maybe this is possible that we could actually move ahead. Um, so then we had a new special rapporteur. Uh, you can continue moving. Um, and then there was, and these are the last few slides because I know I've already gone on too much. But by 2020, uh, we organized the meeting. Sue Young was there again, I think, um, to launch this final push for the Human Rights Council to recognize this new universal right. Um, and everything seemed to be going well. There was huge civil society support. We got the UN Secretary General, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the heads of UNICEF and UNEP to speak. Everybody was saying the time is now. We really need to push forward. A lot of states had, had come on board uh, in the meantime, especially European countries that were, realized that they couldn't stand in the way of this um, unless they would, wanted to be destroyed in the world's press. Um, but then at the kind of the last minute, first of all, we had COVID-19. And then the core group got a little bit of cold feet because the members of the core group changed and the new members were not sure if there was enough support to push this forward. So the next slide. Um, and then a key moment was Costa Rica, a new ambassador to Costa Rica was appointed in Geneva, Catalina de Vandas, and she had instructions to lead the push for universal recognition. At the same time, uh, this global coalition that was just mentioned of civil society organizations, over a thousand, came together with this campaign, The Time Is Now, The Time for Universal Recognition. Um, and uh, it that and various other things, it really gave kind of a final push to the core group to say, okay, let's go for it. So they started drafting along with me and John Knox and So Young and David Boyd, uh, a resolution of the Human Rights Council recognizing the right. If we can go to the next slide. Uh, this was the, this publication was part of the Time Is Now campaign. The next slide. Um, and that led in through various twists and turns and people were panicking, are we going to have enough support? The, some members of the core group were talking about withdrawing the a resolution, not doing it. Um, but especially because the United States was due to become a member of the Human Rights Council in January 2022, uh, the core group thought we have to do it now because otherwise the US, they were sure, would call a vote and vote against. And so in September 2021, the draft resolution uh, through which the council would recognize this new right or new, newly recognized right, universal right was tabled. Um, and next slide, and you know, extreme pushback again from large developing countries and large developed countries. Um, but through the hard work of the core group and especially this civil society coalition, I would say, which really targeted uh, states around the world. Um, we finally got to voting time, so the next slide. And, uh, you know, an overwhelming uh, vote in favor of the resolution. Russia tabled 12 hostile amendments, all were co comprehensively defeated. The UK, which had said that it would vote against or abstain, eventually fell into line mainly because there were some nasty articles about them in the newspapers. Um, I can tell you all where that came from if you're interested <laughs> in the questions. Um, and the only time I've seen in 15 years at the Human Rights Council, applause breaking out, everybody standing up. The president of the Human Rights Council was from Fiji, bro broke into a broad smile. The world's press went crazy. Normally there are no positive articles about what goes on in the Human Rights Council. We counted over 150 in the 24 hours after adoption. And then quickly to the last slide of the General Assembly, that's the special rapporteur uh, cheering after adoption. Next slide. Um, uh, yeah, that's what it does. It recognizes the right to clean, healthy and sustainable environments as a human right. And last slide. And then uh, went to the General Assembly, July 2022, and again, a massive vote, 161 in favor, uh, zero against, even Russia and others decided not to vote against, uh, and only eight abstentions. So we can say this universal right is there, and I can stop talking.
Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mark. It's really difficult to summarize uh, over half century story on the, the building of the right child environment. And also it's a really, really uh, very rare uh, case to hear all about actually what went behind this resolution. So it's really great to have Mark who knows all the dramas and the backstories. <laughs> so just catch him after this meeting if you wanna know more about, I'm sure he'll be very delighted to um, fill in the gaps. So now I wanted to turn this to um, the state's perspective, one of the leading countries uh, to make this happen, Costa Rica. So what that means for states and, um, and um, so I'll give the floor to, I'll invite uh, Anna to the floor. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I'm very proud to be representing my country and uh, uh, I am aware that we have been uh, very pushy in the international arena. And um, even before that, I mean, we have been extremely committed to um, environment. Um, in the eighties, we managed to restore um, 80 percent uh, deforestation and now we have actually 52 percent um, forested areas in the country not to mention that we are working uh, entirely on um, green energy for the past uh, few years so for us um, the recognition of the human right to a healthy environment was only um, the next step um, to follow uh, we are aware that more than 80% of UN member states have already recognized uh, the right to a sa uh, safe, clean, healthy, and sustainable environment in the, either in their constitutions, uh, their environmental legislation, or through ratification of regional treaties and so on. Um, however, um, many of, uh, I mean, there, there was no universal recognition until recently. Um, Costa Rica incorporated the right to a healthy environment in Article 50 on, of its constitution and also through very thorough uh, jurisprudence um, at the constitutional level. Um, and also at the regional level, uh, there have been the recognition of um, the the human rights or uh, to a healthy environment um, and the and its uh, relation to the adverse effects on climate change and the actual enjoyment of all uh, human rights. Um, before it was only done at the regional level. So for example, um, at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, usually um, they would link the other human rights uh, in order to recognize uh, environmental protection, but there was no universal recognition. So for us, there has always been this um, gap that had to be um, filled. And as a very um, progressive uh, country, we are very happy to know that it has um, finally been done. However, it is only the beginning for the next uh, steps of the, if it's actual justiciability and, uh, and how to, to actually make sure that uh, it helps uh, reverse the effects of climate change and uh, environmental um, harm. So, um, we consider that the, this global recognition, of course, uh, will allow for, as I said, the, the further legal development of the rights, um, the creation of um, international uh, law jurisprudence on it, um, also a standardization of uh, best practices, um, obligations to member states, uh, but also to enterprises which are damaging um, the environment, um, also through the, um, you know, the, the use of uh, the business and human rights uh, uh, practices, um, also possible restitution to people, uh, to communities, to indigenous peoples, uh, to children, um, and the real accountability of those uh, um, states of those individuals and enterprises that are um, damaging the, the environment. So um, I guess from, from our sides, uh, we understand that there is a lot of um, resistance from certain um, member states, especially those who might not be as committed to the protection of the environment and the protection of the human rights of 
uh, the, the people in their territories. Um, but we're looking forward to continue pushing and be um, one of those countries that are looking for ambition in the international arena. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. This is really great to have a continuous support from uh, Costa Rica on uh, not just a recognition. Recognition is, uh, is really um, the start. So we need to actually implement the right and also advance the right into like MEAs and also like uh, mainstream this right into the human rights mechanisms and so on. So with that, I we also want to hear from um, the civil society uh, member and see like how does uh, how they see the recognition, how that affects their work, and how they um, are um, in, uh, how they are actually implementing the right on the ground. So I will invite Griffin's Ocheng um, to uh, tell us about uh, his experience on the ground. Thank you so much for, for this invitation and to the Universal Rights Group for inviting me to be in this panel. Uh, it's quite exciting to particularly see the journey, uh, especially how this has come to be of the work in relation to the work that we do. Uh, my focus, uh, and I look at the title of the panel today, where we are and where, where we've come from and where we are going, especially where we stand uh, in this global stage of the three planetary crises uh, of uh, biodiversity loss, uh, climate change, and pollution. And my contribution or reflection will be best, best on the pollution element, uh, because this is where we work, especially my organization and the network that I mentioned, uh, as Center for Environment, Justice, and Development, which is working to promote sound chemicals management um, and waste. Uh, so based on what has been presented by Mark, uh, the recognition of, of the right was uh, the first step in the effort towards environmental protection. And we need to ensure that this uh, is effectively, uh, you know, effective protection of this right is there. Uh, environmental degradation is a serious threat uh, to ability of present and future generations to effectively enjoy uh, all human rights. Uh, I look at this particularly in some of the chemicals that we work in, if you look at mercury, uh, which is a very toxic chemical that affect present and future generation in terms of reproductive uh, and also other effects on, on health, uh, as well as um, you know pesticides, uh, highly toxic pesticides that are affecting many, many particularly vulnerable population, uh, children and women. Uh, and we need to consider this right in relation to the issue of other rights. Uh, we talk about food, uh, right to life, right to know. Uh, if you talk about food, we, we hear in the discussion on HHPs, particularly if you look at the uh, producers as well as those of us who are in public interest that we need food security. But food security is yes, uh, what about the health? Because you may have that food, but you, you, are, you are basically sick uh, that you have to. So this right is very critical. <laughs> And I would like to look at it from two points. Uh, the substantive elements, uh, when you look at clean air, uh, a safe and stable climate, uh, access to safe water, adequate sanitation, uh, sustainably produced food, non-toxic environment uh, in which we work, live and study and play, as well as healthy biodiversity and ecosystem. But I also look at it from the other element, procedural rights. Uh, when you, as, as interest, public interest organizations, we need tools to ensure that these rights are respected, particularly procedural rights, uh, access to information, uh, right to participate in decision making. Uh, we've had a lot of concern, particularly when we were in INC2 in Paris, around civil society participation uh, in decision making. Uh, if we are out of the room, for instance, uh, we have the reality on the ground where we work uh, documenting cases of poisonings, and, you know, toxic impacts and all that as well access to justice and effective remedies, uh, including secure exercise of rights, uh, rights free from reprisals and uh, retaliation. So uh, we view that we can build uh, particularly this right um, also from other conventions, uh, the Harus Convention, Excazu agreements that has really entrenched the issue of right to know, access to information, uh, and we also want to have this right integrated uh, in the ongoing negotiations. Uh, we are currently negotiating a post-2020 framework, just like the one for biodiversity on chemicals, uh, which is going to be adopted in Bonn in September. Uh, especially if you look at pollution, particularly chemical pollution, the issue of right to access information, right to know is very critical. Um, and also in the 
plastic negotiations uh, in the ongoing plastic treaty one of the principles we are pushing is the transparency uh, principle among others a right to know and uh, I would like to give some examples and when it comes to, for instance, right to access information. My organization has been able to work um, through a, a project funded by Basel, Rotterdam and Stockholm, um, which is basically to generate information that ordinarily is not available to the public. Uh, you, you touch plastic, you have children toys. Some of these toys are made from recycled plastics, uh, which are mainly from computers, which are really what we call e-waste. They are made from very toxic chemicals that are currently being negotiated in the Stockholm Convention. They are POPs, persistent organic pollutants. And these are chemicals that are known to be very toxic. If you look at the global 10 chemicals of concern by WHO, you find these chemicals in there. And yet you, the children play around with this and they're also used in various products. And so we conducted this and got a lot of high levels of brominated flame retardants, you, those chemicals that are added to limit uh, flammability of this substance. And these are information, particularly in developing countries that people do not know. Uh, we have no information about this. Uh, they are not made available. So how do we entrench this right to healthy um, environment as well as the right, the procedural rights in order to inform uh, uh, decision and also for those who are using uh, those products. Also, we see that in, particularly in Rotterdam Convention, which is basically about sharing information and many times these are all blocked, some of the listing of very toxic chemical. We just came from the Basel Stockholm Convention where, for instance, you find very toxic chemical fentayon used in, 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 in controlling pests, but some states uh, block this listing. Yet there's already general scientific knowledge coming from the chemicals review committee that these chemicals are very toxic. How do we make them available? But because the convention promotes uh, sharing of information, but you still kind of a lot of find that there's um, you know, blockage and all that kind of. So really at this time, and as we said, where we go, we didn't need to elevate this, this right uh, as was already presented and how we've come to be. Uh, we suggest that in order to ensure that where we are, where we're going, this, these efforts need to be made at, at the national level, also in the constitution. I'm very happy to proud, I'm very proud that in the Kenyan constitution, one of the ambo, uh, preamble is the right to a clean and healthy environment that is mirrored in the Kenyan constitution. I'm not sure how, for instance, in other constitutions uh, across the globe. So in every process, this need to be implemented. Uh, also the right recognition of the right, that means that we need to shift uh, towards a right-based approach in environmental protection uh, is very critical, as well as uh, particular attention to populations that are particularly at risk. Uh, in many developing countries, you find, uh, for instance, uh, informal waste workers, or you find miners using these chemicals, and uh, uh, they, they are really in the front line uh, in terms of the impact uh, that the, the, the pollution causes. Uh, other important element is making sure that business are accountable for the harms of products they put in the market. When we talk about chemical additives in plastic, one of the issues we're talking about is the issue of chemical additives. Association started, we as IPEN and other organizations elevated the issue of health, and that chemicals are plastic treaty is a health treaty. There has to be that recognition because most of these plastics are made of very toxic chemical additives. And finally, uh, attention also to funding institutions. Uh, we talk about uh, multilateral uh, Bretton Woods institutions. How do they ensure that they integrate these rights uh, in decision-making, particularly financing projects uh, that do not uh, you know, kind of uh, erode uh, the, this right uh, in intervention. So they don't seem to funding uh, uh, particularly jeopardize the need for the right to a healthy environment uh, in development that uh, many countries need, but also embed the human rights uh, in the decision-making of, uh, of the decisions made in awarding those financial uh, aids and um, among others. So I think these are some of the reflections that we had and how this has helped us, uh, particularly as civil society. We continue to push this uh, in the ongoing negotiations uh, transparency, right to information, but also just embedding the issue of health and the human face. Uh, uh, lastly, as, as I just mentioned, we, we really, in the negotiation of Minamata Convention uh, back in 2013, uh, we had to document particularly mercury levels in women of childbearing age uh, in, in, in the gold mining area of southwestern part of Kenya, bring to this reality to the negotiation that there is already impact of people that find mercury in their bodies.
we need to look at this uh, and make a human face in the decision we make. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Griffins. So it's really good to have uh, to hear from uh, someone who actually works on the ground about, uh, on the implementation of right. And then we heard about him, how the, the resolutions helped push his work, but also about challenges that he's, uh, con he continues to experience. And um, so, and also he touched base on actually like quite a lot of issues about the contents of the right in a way, so which will actually have a really good transition to what the Melanie is going to present. So the contents of the right and the scope of the right is still being uh, debated. A lot of states ask questions and uh, a lot of um, you know, civil studies and everybody's uh, asking questions about this, but uh, so right is, in my view, I think uh, right it should be understood as uh, in development. So it's always in development, such as right to life didn't start with the contents of what that means. Years ago, it was one line in the ICCPR. So, and that it's been developed. And nowadays it's understood as uh, you know, also the inaction for climate change is can constitute the, the violation of the right to life, which was not the case years ago. So it's still developing, but uh, and so now we have the pleasure of inviting Melina to actually just uh, tell us about the, her research and the publication on the contents of the right and the, the scope of the right to the environment. Over to you, Melina. Thank you. So hi, everyone. Um, like I mentioned before, um, my name is Melina, and I'm a lawyer at NYU School of Law with Earth Rights Advocacy. So today I'll be presenting and talking very quickly about the scope and content of the right to a healthy environment. Um, this was made possible in this event and um, everything was made possible in collaboration with UNEP and with URG. So very thankful to both organizations. And what I wanted to talk about today, you can click, um, is partly about our report. So we just published a report, which you can find in the URG and also the NYU website. Uh, on the right to health environment that clarifies the scope and content. Um, just wanted to put on the table that a lot of the observations I'll be talking about today are part of the report. So these primarily are based on an analysis of about 220 cases of the right to a healthy environment, um, of which 48 we found to be quote unquote notable and that they developed the right in an interesting or progressive way. And then we also analyze about 70 laws uh, that are on the right to healthy environment. That involves domestic and also international laws. So everything I'm talking about will be based on that. One more thing to add on this slide is that, that's it, is that um, NYU with the support of UNEP will be putting all this information in a way that's useful for people on the ground in the first ever right to healthy environment toolkit that we'll be creating and hopefully it'll be out by the end of the year. So I would love to be in contact with you uh, if you work on the right to healthy environment to see how we can best design the toolkit to serve you. Okay, so very quickly setting the scene here and also to clarify one of the reasons why I'm giving this presentation is that um, despite the success that, you know, the development that Mark and um, the rest of the panelists spoke about with the recent recognition of the right to health environment, uh, we have been hearing some comments um, by different actors that there are concerns. One of the concerns is that the resolutions are not binding, right? They're not of a legally binding nature. Um, and other concerns are about the scope and content. Um, a lot of actors might be suggesting that the scope and context of the right are actually not clear enough or developed enough, and therefore that the right must be the object of intergovernmental negotiations um, and further development before it can actually have legally binding meaning, both for rights holders and duty bearers. Well, I'm here to speak with you today and to debunk some of those assumptions and concerns. And I'm going to do this by presenting um, neutral data that uh, shows that the right to a healthy environment indeed is part of a well-established body and growing body of practice comprising both judicial, but also legislation um, and implementation. So in doing this, courts and legislatures have actually really demarcated quite a bit the contours of the right, so the scope and the content of the right. And uh, I imagine you're in this room because you're interested in the implementation of the right to health environment to lead to material outcomes. So for those of us that are hopeful, that means that we don't have to start from scratch when it comes to implementing and uh, developing best practices for the implementation of the right. Thank you, next. <laughs> Okay, so very quickly, what does this body of law look like? I think this was 
partly mentioned in the other presentations, but practically in the last 50 years, in, from the moment in which at the international level, a connection between human rights and um, really the enjoyment of human rights and the protection of the environment was made until fast forward now, where when the resolutions were passed, um, almost every country in the world actually gave effect to the right to healthy environment through either legislation um, or agreements. And those agreements can be um, international or regional, right? But that's really key because we actually did a recount of how many countries have adopted the right to healthy environment in some domestic, regional, or international way. And at this moment, it's 161 countries. So it's almost the entirety uh, of states. In addition, um, I think it's interesting to mention that while a majority of states have adopted the right to healthy environment in some shape or form, uh, in terms of, of cases and in terms of developing the right through jurisprudence, we see the most active regions to be the continents of Latin America, followed by Africa. So props to, to us. <laughs> um, okay, you can click. Okay, so before actually going into very quickly, what the scope and content of the right is, I want the key away of the presentation also because you can look at the scope and content in the report that we published. Um, but I really do want the, the key takeaway here to be why does it matter? So like what happens, you know, what are the implications of this body of law that was developed primarily at the domestic and uh, regional level by states from 50 years ago until now. Um, so there are many, many benefits to this body of law and the development of it. One of them, which I think I've said enough times now, but just so that it's clear, is that the scope and content of the right to healthy environment that has indeed been quite clarified, right? And so while there's still work to be done, uh, this can debunk some of the concerns I spoke about in the beginning. In addition, as Mark mentioned, the right to healthy environment has had positive results on the ground. So you see that countries that recognize the right indeed have better environmental legislation and better environmental outcomes on the ground. In addition, courts themselves have improved the implementation of the right by ensuring the application to various fact-specific circumstances, right? So they have articulated the doctrines, the methods, and the approaches that can and actually should be applied to the right to health environment. And in doing this, they have taken the right from something that's very abstract um, to a concrete norm with material outcomes on the ground. In addition, um, analysis of this body of law that has developed in the last 50 years uh, shows us that there is cross-cutting principles that uh, are applied when the right to healthy environment is uh, legislated upon or is brought into a case. And these cross-cutting principles often lead to uh, better decision-making, right? So having a menu of these principles in the future can help that better decision-making. In addition, um, a lot of the studies that we conduct, so really looking at this body of law from a bird's eye perspective has provided readily available guidelines and best practices. And this allows you know, for model best practices to be followed in the future. And if you're taking a comparative approach, um, these best practices can serve as metrics uh, against which to assess state or corporate or individual uh, practice on the right to health environment. Lastly, one of the benefits of this body of law being developed on the right to health environment is that um, well, it was so well established that as Mark mentioned, by the time that uh, it got to, to the voting time for the resolutions, um, there was a well-established basis, right? For the right to health environment to be recognized at the international level. Um, I actually think that's important to mention that 95% uh, support at the international level for the resolutions. And that's some of the most support that a UNGA resolution will ever get. Next. So that's practically all the benefits that the development of the right, again, at the domestic, at the regional level has had until now. But as you know, um, practically every, everything, uh, every field of work shows that uh, the domestic, regional, and uh, international levels in terms of legal development are really in conversation with each other, right? So the fact that this body of law has been developed at the regional and the domestic level and now at the international level means that there will be benefits all around. Um, we know this, and I just want to point specifically with the environmental field, we know this because, for example, if you look at domestic environmental cases, they're often citing international law and international norm developments. So they're not uh, 
you know, oblivious to what's happened at the international level, right? So the, the fact that the resolutions were just passed will provide a lot of motivation there. In addition, and I come from a climate uh, work background, uh, if you look at, for example, the climate change work, uh, something like the Paris Agreement and other norms that surround it uh, often lead to catalyzing action, right? So it leads to the speeding up of actions on the ground. So the resolutions might have a similar effect. And we also expect it, and beyond that, to have three types, and you know, I'm stealing this partly from the special rapporteurs, so thank you for them <laughs> and all the work they do, but we expect them, the resolutions to have normative, conceptual, and material benefits. I won't go into too much detail about what this could mean, but I'll give an example of each. So in terms of normative benefits, uh, we think that the, the recognition of the right at the international level could really reinforce the right to health environment in terms of it being a co-equal right. So um, as it was mentioned here, the right before wasn't really recognized as a standalone right. And that's really important uh, because the standalone uh, can give you a lot of freedom if you're a court to expand on the right. It often was you know, a derivative right, right? So it would come from the right to life or some other right. But the fact that it has now been recognized at the international level as a standalone right can really help reinforce the status as a co-equal right. In terms of conceptual uh, benefits, we think that the recognition of the right at the international level will promote coherent, consist consistent, and integrated development of norms uh, when it comes to human rights and the environment. There's a lot of work to do, even though now it may seem obvious that human rights and the environment are indeed interrelated, but there's a lot of work to be done there to really come up with a cohesive uh, normative body, right? So this recognition will definitely help. And in terms of material benefits, one thing that it could do, for example, is to close the gap for those states that don't hope to or don't wish to recognize the right, right? So one way that the recognition can do this is by pushing the development of the right to health environment as, you know, maybe customary law. So really something that all states have to follow, even if they're not agreeing to it, but also as a general principle of environmental law. You can click. Okay, so now that I said the main takeaways, which is really that the recognition at the international, domestic, and regional level is really important, um, I will fly through um, the scope and content. And again, this is all in the report, so you can look at the details of this. But in terms of the scope and content, in terms of who has duties under the right and who is protected by the right, our analysis of the, the jurisprudence and of the legislation very obviously shows that whilst governments are primarily hold accountable to the right to health environment, uh, individuals and corporations are also actors that have duties under the right. Um, and when I say duties, I mean both positive duties, meaning the state has to take actual action to make sure that the right is um, implemented, but also negative duties, meaning the state cannot violate the right uh, of people. And so in terms of who is protected, we have two types of, of actors that are protected, individuals, which is self-explanatory, but also interestingly, collectives, right? So um, groups, communities, but also future generations are importantly protected under the right. You can click. Okay, and in terms of some of the components that, you know, as Griffin was talking about are really important, these are some of the components that we identified that keep coming up once and once again, both in legislation and jurisprudence. I won't go through them, but practically you have substantive components and uh, procedural components. And as Griffin was saying, procedural components are really important because um, they lead to better decision-making and actually better implementation of the substantive components that are protected under the right. Another thing that our analysis uh, has identified is cross-cutting principles. So these principles are principles primarily of human rights and international law that you might know. Um, and what they do is that they really positively shape the implementation across jurisdictions, right? And so um, this identification of the principles we hope can help provide uh, conceptual and guiding clarity when it comes to making sure that action is compliant with the right to health the environment, but also with other human rights and environmental norms. Okay, and so just to finish, practically, we also identified a number of best practices by courts and legislatures, which we hope serves as models uh, for future implementation of the right to health environment. Um, again, you can find them all of these in the report. Um, yeah, and practically, 
I think one, one important thing to mention here is that they really, the courts and legislatures have really once and once again used these practices. And there we have seen better outcome and better material outcome on the ground. So uh, we hope that these best practices and hopefully growing best practices uh, can help you and help you uh, on your efforts to make sure that the right is implemented. That's it. Okay, thank you so much, Melina. Also, she had a very, very challenging job of uh, condensing all the good contents in the report in uh, a few minutes. So uh, we invite you uh, um, to have a look at the report, which is really, really great. And uh, thanks so much for presenting today. So uh, without further ado, we'll just open the floor for any questions and comments. And, um, and I apologize that I've been a very bad timekeeper. I was just really into listening to everybody. So. <laughs> So any uh, questions and comments from the floor or anyone uh, uh, who joined online? Okay, Sylvia. Can I just raise the discussion? Because uh, there is uh, the constitution of South Africa, because Fadla has left, maybe would have confirmed this. It uh, guarantees a right to housing. And someone went to court and the court realized that the government does not have the capacity to grant every citizen housing. So there was this uh, landmark judgment about progressive realization of the right as the country becomes, uh, has, gets the capacity to provide housing. So that is sort of deferring a right. The right is not being realized because of the reality that the government cannot grant that right because of the economic situation. Don't you feel like the same could happen to this very right? Where you have, well, I don't know, 160 countries having this right in their constitutions and the laws but failing to guarantee such rights to a section of the population because maybe they're not that developed. Not because the government does not want, or it's not a duty bearer, but because the economic situation does not allow. And it's a reality even with housing that uh, you come, I mean, like a city like Nairobi, there's a lot of to let houses, but there are some people who are living in the slums and all that in deplorable conditions. What would move somebody from a slum to a well-to-do house is what he has in the pocket. It's the, an economic situation. How do you see this new right trying to reconcile that reality that is there? The issue is not that you don't have the right. The issue is not that it's not in the constitution or the law, but the issue is that the governments or the duty bearers in this regard cannot realize these rights because of the reality of the situation. And maybe it's everywhere, otherwise we wouldn't have homeless people in the US and all this. Okay, thank you, Sylvia. And uh, anyone would like to answer this question? Yeah. yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, under international law, all economic, social and cultural rights, including the right to adequate uh, housing, adequate standard of living, right to health, education, they're subject to progressive realization. So for the reasons you said, I mean, it's impossible for a, any country, but especially a developing country, to be able to provide adequate housing for everybody the next day. Um, when it comes to the, uh, and that's established under international law, that it is subject, these right, economic, social, and cultural rights are subject to progressive realization. What I find interesting about the right to a healthy environment is, I th and I wrote an article about this, I think it's probably the first, potentially the first right in history that I would call a hybrid right. It has characteristics of an economic, social, and cultural right. So, you know, over time, uh, governments have to promote uh, the enjoyment of this right by, you know, adopting new legislation to better promote. But it also has characteristics of a civil and political right in that um, governments need to take immediate action. So not progressive realization, immediate action to make sure they're not demonstrably 
violating this right or undermining it, like chopping down rainforests or uh, polluting above safe levels into the atmosphere. So it has characteristics of both. Um, and I suspect the treaty bodies, the UN treaty bodies will, will show this, that it has characteristics of, of both as they come up with general comments and other things, but um, yeah. So. I'll just add to that if I may just uh, so so you're right, Xavier. Like um, there's we always talk about actually there's 103 uh, human rights advocates and promoters, but also that we have 193 human rights violators. Nobody is perfect. No countries are perfect and immune, you know, exempt to from uh, human rights violations. But on this issue, what is really interesting is that such as it brings up a lot of hybrid right. I think that's like perfectly like right term, but also it really brings about human rights are beyond the national borders. So when you talk about like small island countries, like such as Fiji, like they have done so little to contribute to climate change, but they're having the impact, most like one of the worst impacts on the small island countries and Fiji and the communities living there. But how we can, uh, you know, but we've seen uh, we've been we've seen some very encouraging uh, indications and the practices such as Fiji, although the Fijian, Fijian government has some responsibilities, but also a lot of climate induced like displacement and the human rights violations abuses is, is actually caused by other countries. But they've done like really, really good uh, relocation guidelines to relocate the communities uh, to a safer place because um, you know, it's the community is sinking, the villages are sinking. So we've seen like really good examples of how actually countries are doing and adapting to, to the situation. And so that's uh, the, some countries what can do, but also the uh, international level uh, implementation of this, right? is like so important because a lot of countries are experiencing this, not because of they are not doing it, but because they are just victims of a lot of climate change issues and environmental degradation. So, so I think this will actually really need uh, not just a national implementation, but also the global implementation together. So, oh, Anna. Thank you. Um, I will just add up that I believe that it, um, um, the political willingness has a lot to do, and of course, uh, um, the, the, the national legislation and how progressive it can be um, has a lot to do on the, on the impact uh, of the actual realization of, of this right. Although there are some, um, you know, impossibilities to comply with the right entirely, as uh, my colleagues were saying, it's uh, possible not to violate it or to prosecute those who are actually violating. That's the duty of the state. So they don't have to um, directly um, comply with uh, the, 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 the right itself, but there are other ways in which the state can uh, actively collaborate to achieving the right. Um, in our case, our constitution has um, manifested that even though we don't have the funds, uh, the human rights still has to be exercisable. And in the um, climate change arena, we are very committed to um, saying that even though there is little we can do, or we are small countries, or we don't have enough funding, there is always something that the, the state can do to contribute. So I think that position um, would really help for um, to governments to actually implement a human right. I think there is a lot of uh, willingness involved and uh, commitment to, to achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So I got the permission from uh, the most two important people behind the scenes, uh, Julian and Joseph, that we can uh, continue for four more minutes. And I, uh, here, there are two questions uh, online. Yeah, so there are two questions online. The first question is, can you explain again why it's so important to have a standalone right to a healthy environment and why it's not enough to have, for example, just a right to a healthy life? And the second question is, how can we operationalize a right to a healthy environment while also speeding up the clean energy transition? And has it already been recognized in litigation or legislation in the mining of transition minerals? Thank you, Josepha. Those are very, very good questions. I'm gonna turn it into the speakers. <laughs> Any takers for these questions? Uh, go ahead, Mark. I can answer the second. Oh, the first? The first? Okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, okay, I will try. Yeah, I mean, in terms, of, you know, I should be curious to hear what, given that you have more experience in the field, what you have seen the difference between standalone rights and those that don't. But as I mentioned in the presentation, um, the right to health environment, and still is for in some states, uh, been considered to be a derivative right. So like I said, it comes from, for example, often the right to life, right? So we think that from the right to life stems um, your, your privilege or, and your right to have um, a healthy environment. We found from looking at the cases, and I, would be, I want to be clear that the report, again, focuses on the right to healthy environment as a standalone right. So every case we looked at, the 220 cases, are uh, from countries that recognize it as such. But when we were looking at um, those cases where the right was a derivative right, we found that one, the court did not actually pay as much attention to the right, right? Even just from a practical perspective, they did not develop the right or take the, the time or you know, the physical space on the ruling to actually develop the right. And that led to the scope and the content of the right being quite limited, right? So they would really talk about the right to life and go on about it and put the right to a healthy environment as a subtopic. Um, whereas now the, these cases um, centralize the right to a healthy environment. And by doing that, they really do go ahead and you know talk about the substantive components of it, right? So what is the right protecting? Is it protected climate or biodiversity? Um, the procedural components that Griffin went over, right? So it's uh, because you have a right to health environment, you have the right to information that comes from it or the right to participate in important decisions. In addition, um, you see that cases that center the right as a standalone right are able to apply principles of international law that do actually have um, quite a bit of consequences. And going back to the first question about the right to housing, for example, um, something that the recognition of the right to health environment as a standalone right does is by increasing its importance, then you, for example, a court can say, uh, well, I think the right to development matters more than the right to health environment. They actually have an obligation to make sure that they're equal, right? And so now the right to health environment might actually win against other rights, which might be economic development, which often entails a mining project, for example. Um, in addition, other principles that are the courts are able to develop when they center the right to health environment is, for example, the duty to cooperate. States have a duty to cooperate to make sure that human rights are not violated. So if the right to health environment is a human right, for example, going back to the resource question, they might need to get international funding and that might be an obligation, or they will need to employ maximum available resources, which is a very common uh, duty in human rights, right? So they're gonna have, again, they're gonna have to do a different balance. So this is some of the things that we've seen in cases that recognize it as a standalone right, as opposed to having it be a derivative right. Thank you. Um, I would just like to add that, for example, in the Inter-American system of human rights, uh, for indigenous people's cases, they used to link, uh, uh, I mean, the environmental aspect to the right to life or the um, right to um, freedom of belief. So they would understand the, the you know, the cosmovision of indigenous peoples. But then in practice, it would really impact, uh, for example, any cases related to the environment from, um, I don't know, uh, farmers or anything similar. So it would actually undermine the indigenous people's rights in a way. So I think the, the fact that uh, the human right to a healthy environment is now recognized universally as a standalone right really um, uh, avoids this kind of uh, legal issues that were happening in the past and just makes it uh, better for policymakers and for judges all around the globe. Thank you. And um, for the person that asked that question, I think it, it was a special rapporteurs that came up with the framework of normative conceptual material benefits. So I think they have somewhere in the internet put out um, an analysis of the, the benefits of it being a standalone right, and it was in preparation for the resolution. So it was, it was part of the advocacy effort. Um, so I encourage you to look that up. Okay, um, then I don't see any other questions and uh, I, we are way over the time limit. So I'll just, uh, if that's okay, we'll just um, finish up for the first panel and then have a short coffee break and then we'll gather here in uh, 10 minutes again for this panel too. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.
So the last question of the previous panel was actually about how to operationalize uh, the right to a healthy environment. And that's why I didn't answer it because I thought, well, that's the subject of this um, panel. Um, what next is the basic idea. And, you know, as was mentioned in some of the presentations earlier, actually a lot is already happening since spurred on or catalyzed by UN recognition of the right to a healthy environment. For example, I'll just give a few examples at national level, because uh, the UN recognized the right to a healthy environment, Malaysia, about a week later, they recognized the right to a healthy environment in their national law. Uh, a regional level, um, the European, uh, European Human Rights System, the European Convention on Human Rights did, ne did not include or does not include the right to a healthy environment. Um, environment has always been dealt with under the right to life or the right to health. But now the Council of Europe uh, has decided and agreed at, at head of state or head of government level that they're going to negotiate new optional protocols to the European Convention on Human Rights to add the right to health environment to the European human rights system, which is huge. And again, that's been catalyzed by the UN. Um, at international level, just one example, uh, for the first time, um, the right to a healthy environment was included in the International Climate Change Agreement, which was the uh, Sharm el Sheikh Agreement that came out of the Egyptian Egypt COP. Um, again, thanks to largely to Costa Rica. So, what I find interesting with all of these things is it shows, notwithstanding everyone likes to criticize the UN, uh, the UN still has an unparalleled ability to inspire. And that is one of the big benefits of UN recognition that inspires civil society around the world, inspires governments uh, to push that extra mile um, and push forward with recognition. We call that the normative cascade. But anyway, so we have different uh, speakers now who are going to look at different elements of how to take forward and operationalize the right to healthy environment. Uh, we're going to start with three uh, online speakers who are joining us virtually. The first is uh, Milka Chepkuri, I think is coordinator of Defending Territories of Life at the ICCA Consortium. Uh, Milka, are you with us? And if so, if you could uh, take the floor and you have seven or eight minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, and good evening, everyone. Um, joining you from Charangani. It's a little bit uh, chilly here. Um, and so I'm going to speak about the, the status of this implementation of the rights to healthy and, uh, you know, a healthy environment from the CSO perspective. And really to say that, as, as you've mentioned, uh, Mark, on the progress of how this recognition came to be and you know, even the push to adopting it, it really gives us as civil society the platform to push against the violations of the rights, which um, has been um, almost the norm of the day when it comes to groups or even communities or peoples living in their environments. Um, and I have been working with indigenous people and communities. So I, I, I will not give examples or any reflections from individual rights to like really individualized rights to healthy environment. Um, but in this sense then, um, what we are trying to do even, you know, uh, since the adoption of this is to make sure that communities, indigenous peoples are aware of the adoption of this right mainly because um you know even as we're talking about climate change and uh, what leads to it which of course now is the unsustainable development coming to community lands coming to territories coming to you know common water points within communities and and peoples is is to make these communities aware of this having been recognized as an international you know law and um you know and even in the countries um, and as much as this is something that has been recognized just recently at the UN, we appreciate the fact that some of the African countries, uh, Kenya, for example, South Africa, and others have had these rights already recognized in their constitutions. Um, but the main challenge has always been that the populations are not that aware 
of this, you know, the 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 uh, I'd say the, the responsibility of states to uh, guarantee the right to to clean and healthy environment. And this ignorance by the people then is taken advantage of by companies um, and, and by states themselves to violate the rights uh, to these clean and healthy environments. Um, and how we've tried to work on this is, of course, not to look at it as an a standalone, right? Because again, it links to so many other rights, which includes the right to land and the right to the water, the right to you know every other resources that communities um, are, are using and sustainably using within their territories, which as I mentioned, of course, and as you mentioned, even during the introduction is being threatened by the unsustainable uh, development measures that are being taken by, by countries. And as we work on this as civil society, pushing governments to be accountable, pushing governments to recognize this, we at the same time pity, uh, especially governments in, in Africa or in, in the global south or generally what we would call the developing world, because then it looks exactly like it is a pull on this end on denying development to these countries when you require them to um, you know, guarantee safe, I mean, a safe and clean environment for, for its population. Um, I say this because I've been in some discussions before and one of the government officials from, was it the government of Uganda really, was saying, you know, how can the UN and the, the many powerful countries, you know, pushing decisions be pushing for what makes African countries continue to be underdeveloped or less developed uh, when they themselves, now the developed world, have already exploited their resources. They've used those resources actually to give their own citizens rights to, to clean environment. And so that tension leaves the population, the people in, in a tensed situation where then the states uh, would agree to guarantee safe and clean environment, but on the other hand, desire to develop again in the path of unsustainable development um, that has been walked before by the North and, and the West. Um, and that then puts, you know, those organizations, individuals that are pushing for the recognitions of race rights at like immense danger, because then it looks like we are, you know, stepping or standing at the door um, blocking countries or states from developing or even companies and um, factories and industries from making their profits. Um, but it's it's work in progress, you know. Um, it's about taking it step by step and making communities and peoples and the citizens generally to be aware of this so that then we have many people uh, demanding for this, right? And, and really to to tell it out there that it's it's not that it is recognized first so that we are demanding, but the fact that it is being violated, that it is being demanded. Um, and the other thing that, that has been um, an achievement for, for many of uh, civil societies, even before the adoption of, of this, right, is that can, yeah, civil societies and communities have been able to walk into, you know, law courts and sue governments, sue um, companies for violating the rights to clean and healthy environments, and they've been successes. One of them uh, was highlighted last, was it the last three years, by the special rapporteur, and it was here in Kenya, in Mombasa where a community has been exposed to lead poisoning. Um, and, and really, even if that wasn't as pretty much anchored in the Kenyan constitution, it borrowed so much from what is happening around the world. And seeing that as a success of, you know, a civil society that took government to, to the courts is, is something that then others are borrowing from and, and seeing that this is something that 
you know, we can challenge legally. It's a shame, of course, I would say this uh, again, it's a shame that then violation of rights have to be worn in court when the rights have already been violated and people are dying and people are suffering the effects of violation of their right to clean and healthy environment. Um, but we hope that with the now the adoption of this, um, the recognition of this, then it, it helps us civil societies and even the governments uh, to work on more, um, be, be more proactive uh, than, you know, waiting for things to happen, then run to court to, to win and cite cases of winning against governments or companies when really the damage is, is there. But yeah, all in all, um, I, I really um, uh, celebrate that this was finally adopted and it's now a lot of work for the civil societies um, to make sure that this, this right is, is recognized and really guaranteed to, to communities and to the populations of countries. Yeah, I think that's all that I would want to say for now, thank you. Thank you, uh, Milka, also for reminding us that, I mean, one of the great beauties, I think, of the right to a healthy environment is its ability to empower and protect those who work to protect the environment. But as you rightly say, in order for them to do that and hold the governments to account, they first need to know that they have this right and what it means in practice so that they can actually then assert the right and hold the governments to account. And in that civil society plays the essential role. Um, so thank you for your work on that. And the other thing I mentioned earlier in my introduction, you know, I've never seen the kind of mobilization of civil society around a human rights issue, uh, as I saw with the right to healthy environment. I think, you know, in the week before uh, the vote at the Human Rights Council. I was in an email group with about 1,600 different NGOs and civil society actors around the world, and my inbox was just flooded, especially when it was adopted. Everyone just went completely crazy. And that was recognized, as was said earlier, by the UN General Assembly by giving that co one of the coalitions the human rights, UN Human Rights Prize. Okay, uh, we will now uh, jump to Inga Wolfgang Salat, who is Professor of Constitutional Law at the Pontifical University of Rio Grande do Sul. Sounds a very glamorous university. I definitely think we should all have the next meeting there. Um, and Inga will uh, look take Brazil as a case study about constitutionalism and the right to healthy environment and how they've come together in that national context. So Ingo, if you are there, the floor is yours for seven to eight minutes, please. Ah, so he's there. Inga. Okay, so Ingo, I did introduce you to everybody in the room, so I won't do it again. But if you're there, I would like to take the floor. Ingo, you probably need to speak and then it will. No. Well, let's get to. Well, uh, let's go to Philip and then we can try and get Ningo there. So, uh, Philip, as I mentioned, from the UN Committee of the Rights of the Child, uh, that recently published a very interesting general comment relevant to today's discussion. Uh, and I know, Philip, you need to leave fairly soon. So, I'm happy to give you the floor. Please, over to you. Thank you very much. Can you uh, hear me all right? Yes, perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for the kind invitation. Um, who said uh, that we are in the dog days of summer? Um, 
So let me begin by um, acknowledging the quality of the interventions I've heard so far, all very interesting. And um, so to move on quickly uh, to the news of the day, uh, many, if not all of you are aware, and it's been mentioned that um, we have been toiling the Committee on the Rights of the Child away at the production of a general comment on children's rights and the environment with a special focus on climate change. It's been two years in the making. And, um, and as co-coordinator of the process, all I can say is uh, never again. Um, so much work. The news is that we are days away from publication. Adoption happened back in May, but uh, between adoption and publication, there's a hiatus. And this morning we received the instruction from the UN Central Editing Services that we have 48 hours to react to their um, editing proposals. So it is being finalized and then heads for publication probably next week and also into the translation pipeline. Uh, my best guess is next week, as I said. Um, but I think the central point I want to make is that I truly believe that this will be a game changer with regard to the human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. Um, along with the previous speakers, I should also probably underline right off the bat that all this work is a collective effort, uh, civil society, of course, so several states, small and big, <laughs> special rapporteurs, our experts at Terre des Hommes, Germany, and a very important 15,000 children who participated directly in guiding the committee's work. So uh, let me step back a little bit in time and give some context. Um, and this will lead into where we're heading and uh, what, what comes next. So first, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has been keenly interested in children's rights and the environment since at least 2015, when we dedicated um, our day of general discussion to this topic. And the topic stayed, I should say, increasingly on our radar ever since. Um, even if, and this is my admission, we dropped the ball a little. And then in 2019, there were these momentous child-led protests against climate change. And um, the committee also received an individual communication, or I should say collective complaint, from 16 children alleging that five states were violating their funda fundamental children's rights, including the right to survival. And these events pushed us into overdrive and the decision to produce a general comment. And as we were in the initial stages, we were quite hesitant. Cold feet was an expression earlier around the notion of human rights, of a human right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment, not so much at face value, but under international law. Could the Committee on the Rights of the Child go so far, be bold enough to recognize a new right? Were we not going to head beyond our mandate? And some of my colleagues were very prudent on this issue. But uh, fortunately, the uh, 2021 uh, Human Rights Council resolution and the General Assembly uh, later on um, freed us up. So here we are a few days from the publication and the wording of uh, General Comment 26 is the following. And I'm quoting, children have the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. And this right is implicit in the convention and directly linked to, in particular, the rights to life, survival, and development, highest attainable standard of health, uh, standard of living, education, etc. So just for total clarity, children have the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment. But to dot our, T, our I's and cross our T's, we further state, we, 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 let me just insist on this, that, that this right is implicit in the convention. So we're not inventing something, so to say, or pulling something out of our hats. Um, additionally, one of the first paragraphs of the general comment states, and I quote, a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment is both a human right itself 
and necessary for children's full enjoyment of a broad range of rights. So it is a standalone right, not a derivative, and also linked to many different uh, other children's rights. Um, so let me cite another passage that I believe bears some implications for the future of uh, children's environmental rights. Uh, and I should add that we adopted this passage by its whiskers. I really mean at the last minute. And it was a struggle, um, perhaps an issue of cold feet for the committee. Um, so here's the passage that we uh, adopted. The committee recognizes the principle of intergenerational equity and the best interests of future generations to which the children consulted overwhelmingly referred. While the rights of children who are present on earth require immediate urgent attention, future generations are also entitled to the realization of their human rights to the maximum extent. And beyond, this is important, beyond their immediate obligations under the convention with regard to the environment, states parties bear the responsibility for foreseeable environment related threats arising as a result of their acts or omissions now, the full implications of which may not manifest for years or even decades. And here we're quite clear that we're opening us up, ourselves up to perhaps a whole new slew of uh, complaints and, um, and individual communications um, because of emissions of states with regard to foreseeable consequences. So to, to, to summarize where we're, where we're heading, obviously the general comment we know already will help uh, civil society in their advocacy efforts and um, will be used as leverage by all the uh, environmental uh, human rights uh, defenders and environmental rights defenders, including the many children that qualify as such. Um, the general comment will also push us to engage with states during our constructive dialogues and challenge them a lot more than we have done so far, um, and perhaps uh, um, follow up uh, more strenuously on some of our interactions. And also, obviously, this will lead to much more pointed recommendations in our concluding observations, uh, those uh, observations that we generate after each state party uh, review. Um, and I should point out, and there's some publications by Ciel on this, that all the other human rights treaty bodies are upping their game in terms of uh, mentioning uh, climate issues in their general observations. And there's a very, quite a steep um, curve in terms of volume of recommendations uh, in these documents. And finally, I, I do hope that we participate uh, by this general comment in enhancing all the litigation that's ongoing and will be coming up, um, uh, and that it will open, as I said, the door to many new individual communications and complaints. In our, in our, um, in our uh, general comment, we do call on states to uh, provide effective remedies, uh, that they, these remedies should be available to redress violations and promote social justice, and that the states should um, remove barriers that um, impede uh, children to have standing um, and uh, being able to file complaints within uh, the national jurisdictions. Um, and I hope this will really give a push. If not, uh, we do expect, again, uh, some uh, complaints or individual communications uh, under OPIC. Let me end with uh, a celebratory note. Um, so as I said, we adopted in May. Hopefully by the end of July, it will be published officially. And then mark in your calendars, 18th of September is the date of the official launch at uh, the UN in uh, Geneva, Palais des Nations. There will be an event uh, to which uh, member states, uh, civil society, um, and um, uh, all our experts and all the ch many of the children on our advisory panel 
will participate. And then there will also be a global uh, dimension that is uh, carried out by um, our uh, civil society partners uh, with events around the world in the afternoon or at different hours, depending on the time zones, uh, tree planting and uh, many um, events to which uh, children will participate. So in a nutshell, I, I do think that this general comment will generate some excitement. I'm really hopeful that the children will latch on to it and um, use it to be even more at the forefront for uh, climate justice and climate change. And um, I look forward to, uh, uh, the, to the dust not settling. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Philip, um, for that sneak preview of, I agree, it's, it's already generating a lot of excitement, at least in Geneva. I've heard all about it, but I, it's the first time I've had a sneak preview of the, some of the content uh, of it, and I, it's incredibly important. I mean, it goes back to what I was saying before about the power of the United Nations, the Human Rights Council, the General Assembly to inspire and to guide positive change, whether it's at international level, regional level, or national level. Uh, and the fact that the Committee of the Rights of the Child is going to come up with the first general comment that explicitly recognizes the right of children to the right to health, clean, healthy, and sustainable environments is incredibly exciting. And as you said, I'm sure it won't be the last treaty body because I know uh, other treaty bodies are also looking at the same issue, the right to healthy environment and climate change potentially even to start to think about elaborating by the treaty bodies some of the scope and content uh, of the right to a health, clean, healthy and sustainable environment. Okay, I think now we have Ingo there, who I won't introduce for a third time. Uh, Ingo, I can see you actually as well. So I already introduced you. I don't know if you caught it when I did. Um, but I explained that you will be presenting uh, a case, the case to do Brazil uh, in terms of constitutionalism and the right to healthy environment. So Ingo, over to you, seven or eight minutes, thanks. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you're listening, hearing, it's okay now? Yes, I think we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, okay, yeah, sure. <laughs> thank you yeah. so much, I'm sorry for, for this trouble. Um, okay, first, Hello to all participants, and it's a pleasure and honor to be with all of you. I like to thank for the invitation, uh, and I thank you also my colleague and friend Thiago Fensterzeifer. I mentioned this because he's the co-author with from this draft and from several books we have published, including a last one about climate changes in in, in Brazil. Uh, so I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, to explain a little bit about the right to a health environment in Brazil and our federal Could you speak a little bit closer to the mic? Because it's okay, the sound is not right. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm, you know, better. It looks very nice wherever you are, but the, the acoustics is not. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, sounds better. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. Better. yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm accessed from my iPhone because I'm in vacation. I'm finishing the vacation catch a flight. Uh, immediately after <laughs> my talk, so sorry for this. No? Uh, and okay, no? to talk about our constitution uh, by itself, no? the text is so long that it would take probably, even for Tom Cruise, it would be a mission impossible, really impossible, impossible to do. Uh, but I will try to do my best in eight minutes, uh, ten, eight minutes. Uh, first of all, our constitution is one of the first in the world, worldwide, to recognize the right to environment, to safe envir environment, and along with this right, a set of rules and principles and other state duties to implement this right. Uh, the first one was, uh, so far as I know, the Portuguese Constitution 76, the Spanish Constitution, Constitution 78 did not have a fundamental right as such. Uh, a very important step uh, after war, war was the inclusion in our constitution uh, from uh, of the civil public action. It's very difficult to translate. It's a kind of class action to enforce collective rights, not only the rights environment, but this uh, action is, has been very important to implement in thousands and thousands of judicial uh, trials the rights environment, the very positive and progressive sense. Uh, this, it has now the status of a constitutional right and remedy, this constitutional class action. Um, uh, in, our, in our constitution, we have 
for instance, the prohibition of reg 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 regression in environmental matters, uh, an ecological cooperative federalism, and the prevalence of the most protective legal regime in ecological terms, the indubio pro natura principle, uh, the ecological dimension of human dignity, the dimension, the dignity of nature, environmental rights of participation, an ecological minimum of existence, the existence of even implicit environmental state duties, among others. This all has been recognized uh, by our federal Supreme Court in the last 15, 10 years, uh, and especially also the status uh, of a fundamental right for the right to environment, because this right was not uh, included in the fundamental rights catalog as such, but in the very important decision, the leading case from 1995, 1996, Supreme Court said this is also a fundamental right. It's a full set, the full strength of fundamental rights in our constitution. This is a very important development showing that uh, besides the constitutional framework as such, the positive law, we have a very strong uh, evolution in our jurisprudence, especially from our Supreme Court. Uh, recently, it's also um, very important to, to mention and it's having a great impact even in, in lawsuits uh, abroad in other countries uh, for, for damages caused in Brazil, uh, is a very, very, very strong uh, system of civil li liability for environmental damage. For instance, uh, in our constitution, in our legislation, and also in our jurisprudence. I will only mention the full risk theory a solidarian uh, objective uh, liability, liability for both um, pure and immaterial damages, uh, the inversion of the burden of proof. Uh, so this uh, a very broad concept of pollution and polluter, including the so-called indirect polluter. Uh, so this is very well developed and is now the, the standard uh, in our jurisprudence. Um, uh, and finally, I will give some examples related to climate protection, because of, of course, also in Brazil, <laughs> uh, and we are uh, unfortunately not very well uh, known uh, in this domain, especially considering the Amazon forest deforestation and devastation. Uh, but recently, we have, we have had uh, some important decisions from our Supreme Court. The most important one, the leading case, is the so-called climate fund clay, clay, claim uh, case, in which the Supreme Court um, uh, recognized the unconstitutionality of the omission by the federal government to implement uh, the fund, the this climate fund uh, created by the legislator to to fund uh, all a lot of activities and programs to fight deforestation, climate change in the Amazon region. Uh, this is a well-known case. Uh, and in this case, another very important aspect of this case, I'm only mentioning uh, one of them, uh, is that now, from now on, we have a consolidated jurisprudence in the Federal Supreme Court that all environmental law treaties, even not being as such human rights treaties, uh, should have the same legal rank, the same legal status of all human rights treaties, which means in Brazil, a supra-legal rank, uh, which means uh, in some, these uh, treaties have uh, prevailed over all internal domestic legislation, but are only uh, above our, under our constitution. This is a very important development. Uh, uh, the right to, to uh, Safe climate uh, is being now discussed in our uh, National Congress uh, proposal and uh, constitutional amendment proposal to include this right in our fundamental rights catalog as an explicit fundamental right. Uh, and of course, uh, we have some measures now being undertaken by the current government, the new government in Brazil. Uh, and at least we have some important uh, goals achieved now in a short time. There is uh, a reduction, a decrease of the deforestation in the Amazon region, a very important decrease if you consider the, 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 the six months
government of the new government uh, and we have of course uh, other um, measures being undertaken such uh, more investment such the creation uh, in the ministry of uh, environment uh, special special section for climate uh, protection is now the ministry for environment and climate protection uh, and this is of course uh, something which uh, shows that we are at least trying to <laughs> to 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 keep uh, going on with fighting uh, environmental damages environmental devastation climate change in brazil uh, of course uh, we have a lot of critics in relation to the primary role played by the judiciary so we can trust that only judges are responsible for implementing uh, climate uh, protection environmental protection that's of course correct no? but to 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 take the court in brazil at least at the current status no, standard of protection we have in our supreme from the superior court of justice away from the environment would be a great mistake a big mistake as well so this kind of co-governance uh, a kind of judicial co-governance uh, with uh, of course the most important legislative and uh, executive measures is in my opinion and i'm not alone in this sense uh, the best way we could now uh, really uh, approach our goals at least part of the goals in relation to the reduction of uh, green gas emissions and Amazon forest devastation, and of course the heavy problems we still have in terms of environmental protection. So uh, I was very short, I spoke very fast, <laughs> and I apologize Ms. for leaving uh, in brief because I must catch a flight. So thank you so much for this. No need to apologize. Thank you so much for joining us on holiday. I mean, this is unprecedented commitment to the right to a healthy environment. Um, and thank you for reminding us. I mean, this panel is looking at what next, you know, what do we do next? And always at the back of our mind, we have to remember that the key now to the, with this right is to realize it at national and local level. It means that states need to implement uh, this right. I mean, you mentioned that it's the, the right to health environment has been in the Brazilian constitution for a long time. And yet we all know Brazil, like many other countries, is not without its uh, environmental and climate challenges, uh, especially perhaps under a recent uh, government administration in Brazil. Uh, and that demonstrates, again, the importance of implementation at national level. And we all have a role to play there, but states at the end of the day are the main duty bearer. Uh, and so we really need to find a way, uh, which leads us, by the way, into the big debate when we're looking, which I won't go into, but the big debate when we look ahead is whether we need a new international treaty, an international convention on the right to a healthy environment. This debate pits me and David Boyd on one side against uh, uh, John Knox and maybe Sir Young and others on the other. But anyway, if anybody has any thoughts uh, on that, it would be good to hear. Uh, but again, it's about what is the best way to secure implementation of this right, which brings us nicely to uh, Christine uh, Gekingonga, who is the executive director of the Katiba Institute. Um, and she will look at the implementation of the right to healthy environment in Kenya. And I apologize uh, for my pronunciation. Um, and we'll talk about something we've been working with you on, and this is perspectives on a potential future regional treaty for Africa on environmental rights. Uh, I'm please, very pleased to give the floor to somebody who's actually here in the room, sat next to me, please, Christine. Okay, yes. thank you, Mark, and uh, a good effort on the pronunciation yeah. of the African name. Mm. Uh, so as Mark has said, I work for Katiba Institute, which is, it is a national level um, non-government organization based here in Kenya. So Katiba means constitution in Swahili. So we are a constitutional institute. So doing constitutional advocacy, education research, and uh, lately litigation advocacy. So I'll try and not replicate what Milka said because she's based in Kenya as well. As she has said, uh, Kenya 
is one of the 35 countries in Africa that has uh, the right to a clean and healthy environment in their constitutions. Um, over 40 countries in Africa also recognize the right to a clean and healthy environment, although as five of those don't do so in their uh, constitutions, but in other national laws and frameworks. Uh, Kenya adopted its, I mean, after independence in 1963, our constitution did not have the right to a clean and healthy environment. It was really closely tailored to the European Co uh, Convention on, on Human Rights because that was adopted in 1953 and Kenya became independent in 1963 and 1964. But in 1999, Kenya adopted MCA, which is the Environmental Management and Coordination Act that documented a lot of the then agreed international principles and standards on environmental protection. So all the main principles that are applicable until now uh, were codified in that domestic national legislation in 1999. That legislation uh, provided a right to environment, but was not justiciable because it was not recognized as a constitutional right. But it established a green tribunal or a green court, as some people call it, that is the National Environment Tribunal that would litigate um, environmental issues. So after we codified the right in our constitution in 2010, it now makes the right more tangible, more enforceable. It becomes an entitlement. Government has to plan for it, has to ensure that it's realized and promoted. And if it's not provided, it becomes a violation of an individual community uh, and group rights, um, all those are, are recognized in our constitution. So um, because of that, then Kenya set up, apart from the Green Tribunal, an environment and land court that also has a wider mandate on environmental justice matters. So for the last 10 years, we've uh, been able to play around with the right to a clean and healthy environment, a justiciable one. And because of that, uh, a lot of litigation has happened in Kenyan courts, some in, in which Katiba Institute participated uh, in various capacities. Um, the, what we found, at least in the last um, 10 years, is because um, government policies, directives, and practices are really not caught up on the issue of the right to a clean and healthy environment. Um, the court has come in to try and enforce that and make it more um, stronger implementation and uh, of the right to a clean and healthy environment. As some as have indicated, we've had right on why should we have a coal plant in Kenya when other countries are moving to just energy um, uh, transitions, green energy transitions. And the pushback is that uh, Western countries developed on the basis of coal power. Why should Africa be denied that, that um, chance as well? Um, and, um, but the court, you know, held that back and said on the basis of the Paris Agreement, on the basis of our constitution, on the basis of our Climate Change Act, Kenya cannot be having a coal plant um, when it has so many other green energy options, less polluting. Uh, we've also talked, um, now there's litigation going on about genetic biodiversity, how to protect Kenyan African biodiversity. Um, issues to do with um, conservation vis-a-vis -vis land rights and community rights. There's a bit of um, a, a strain uh, between conservation and community and group rights, and especially in Africa when we bring that in relation to cultural rights. Uh, I think the famous Andrew Royce case um, comes in there. So the issue of do we conserve the environment, the forests, the rivers, but what about communities that um, need access to these spaces uh, for cultural uh, purposes. Um, and recently in the last three or two years, we are now seeing more litigation around climate impacts um, and, and good uh, litigation we hope is coming soon on that causal link between the effects of carbon emissions and, um, and multinationals that have driven carbon emissions in the West and now that Africa is suffering um, greatly from climate change impacts, um, why don't we be national level litigation against these multinational companies for the harm that we are seeing uh, right now in Africa and in Kenya. So that is all in development and we're hoping in the next two or three years, we start getting good, good decisions from the courts. So one of the things we've learned as well from this process is um, apart from the problems you have with uh, government policies, practices, directives needed to catch up with the law 
is also you need to have a lot of capacity development for uh, the reg regulatory bodies that are mandated with overseeing very technical, very new um, areas um, of, of law. Um, I think the case mentioned here about lead poisoning, I think the National Environment Management uh, Body said at that time they did not have capacity to properly regulate um, companies uh, dealing with lead. And that oversight led to, to loss of life and, and, and serious uh, tragedies in that community. So capacity development for regulatory bodies, for the judiciary, we have a feeling at the moment the civil society is at, outpacing the judiciary in terms of learning about climate science and all the things that are happening um, at, um, at the international level. And we need to capacitate um, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the judiciary to do so. One of the more interesting cases coming up is um, about these county governments that uh, planted eucalyptus and they have dried up uh, water, but, uh, underground reservoirs um, in certain areas, creating deepening uh, water scarcity in those areas. So that is coming up and, and all of these uh, interesting things. Um, very quickly, <laughs> I'm running out of time. Um, but, and the other challenge apart from political will is African countries, including Kenya, because of economic recovery programs, um, prior prioritizes economic development uh, over environmental protection. So Kenya, for them, they have decided to do huge infrastructural developments um, and generally in areas that are ecologically sensitive. Um, and that actually then has a huge impact um, on the environment. Um, but the narrative then plays out in the public. We need this to make your life better. So then brings a lot of pushback between environmental activists, communities, and the government on the other side, which naturally increases the risk for human rights uh, defenders and activists. I believe last year, at least there was one killed in Uganda, not yet in Kenya, at least from last year. But those are things that we always look at whenever we are doing environmental litigation. In, is it a politically sensitive matter or project? And the other one is big business and environmental protection there's a lot of risk associated with trying to bring um, about change in relation to business and human rights. Um, the other problem emerging now is slap suits. I think in American legal space, that is very common and now in South Africa, but in Kenya, we are seeing increasingly a lot of slap suit from multinational corporations against local human rights defenders trying to get the right to a clean and healthy environment. So I'll quickly talk about um, and maybe the last one I'll mention before I talk about binding voluntary uh, regional or continental treaty is the issue of the problems we are having with regionally shared resources. Um, Lake Trukana, the Serengeti, the Mara, and all, all this brings a lot of challenges whereby issues in Ethiopia will affect Kenya and the problems with as Kenyan um, human rights defenders and environmental defenders we cannot bring a suit unless Kenya does that on our behalf. But if we had a binding treaty, Africa-wide binding treaty that allows for redress mechanisms, maybe I as a Kenyan could go to this uh, forum to litigate against the series of dams on the river Omo that will likely dry up um, Lake Trukana uh, way in the future. So that I'll leave it there and then I just talk about, well, does uh, Africa need a continental binding or voluntary agreement. I mean, as Marka said, there's a way that um, continental or global agreements have the, a way of catalyzing and, and moving change at, um, at the more regional and not domestic level. As we've said, country, uh, I mean, only 35 of the countries have um, constitutionally recognized rights. So maybe if we have a binding uh, continental agreement, then that will um, go ahead to push to solidify uh, the, the right to a clean and healthy environment. Uh, governments tend to take an enforceable right uh, more seriously than aspirational right, um, because then there are repercussions to not um, um, meeting commitments and a binding right. So in terms of moving, ensuring there's no laxity, a binding instrument would be uh, good, and especially if it provides a redress mechanism. I think also as 
uh, environmental defenders we have been talking about environmental crimes being litigated before an international forum, whether it is an international criminal forum, would make um, would make it um, stronger, uh, would make the right more stronger here in Africa because there's laxity of really um, doing something about uh, environmental crimes. And the laws that provide for penalties under environmental crimes tend to be a bit lax. Some say binding should not be the way to go because it takes a lot of time because then there'll be pushback uh, because governments now will be acquiring binding uh, um, uh, actionable rights. So some think a voluntary agreement would be better. It will still set standards, norms that can be uh, copied and applied in African countries. It will help African countries to more uh, organically grow and uh, build upon the voluntary, uh, voluntary agreement uh, without forcing things on them. And maybe it will be more easily adaptable when it's voluntary. And people think that even for businesses, and the corporate sector, it is easier for them to agree to voluntary agreements than to binding agreements. And they are likely able to also organically uh, move others to join these voluntary agreements um, and therefore move towards a stronger recognition of the right, um, apart from being now defensive, because probably you take them to court uh, on, on this issue when it's a binding agreement. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. It's funny that. The debate you mentioned then in terms of the region, potential regional African treaty uh, is playing out as well at the international level about an international new international convention on the rights of a healthy environment. And actually, most NGOs are against an international convention yeah. for the reason you mentioned. Uh, the Universal Rights Group isn't against, but most others are. Uh, for the reason you mentioned, they think it would take such a long time and would... Um, drag on for years uh, and therefore would detract from progress elsewhere. Um, and thanks also for reminding us that, you know, for implementation to happen at national level, two things are necessary. One is the political will, but also there's the capacity constraints faced by a lot of countries. You mentioned it in the context of the judiciary, but also some uh, Milka mentioned it in the context of civil society. And that leads nicely to the last, but definitely not the least, uh, short presentation from So Young uh, from UNEP, which will be, which is on the degree to which the UN human rights mechanisms uh, and the UN system are focused on the interrelationship between the human rights environment and climate change, including the right to a healthy environment and the situation of human rights defenders, and the degree to which the UN system is then working with countries to help them uh, implement the recommendations they received from the UN to strengthen the, uh, the enjoyment of environmental rights. Uh, so, so Young, you've You've already done your job for the day, which was to be a chair, but we've dragged you back to speak on this. And then we'll open for questions if we have time. And then we'll go to Alfred for a few closing remarks. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for boring, uh, bearing with me for another few minutes. So and I see like 5 p.m. is uh, the finishing time. And I'm just starting now. So um, just a quickly, uh, just a mention on the, what actually the right to healthy environment of recognition means for the UN. It's, uh, it means quite a lot in uh, every sense in the, the policy level, also the implementation level. So like this is a right actually that brought a lot of UN agencies together working on human rights issues, working on development issues and working on environmental issues. So with this and on the journey to the recognition, actually a lot of UN agencies worked together, namely, uh, of course, UNEP, OSHR, UNDP, UNICEF, and all the others. We uh, So that actually brought all the agencies to work together. And even after the recognition, we're working a lot on the, the implementation side of it. So we're at uh, two levels at the policy level. So we need a policy to be actually able to uh, to implement on the ground, but also at the implementation level. So like just one example is uh, you know, OSHR, UNDP, and uh, UNEP working together is uh, UNEP and uh, OSHR. We work on a lot of um, the policy issues, especially UNEP, because uh, we don't have a lot of um, country presence, but also working with the UNDP on this side, it makes it really easier for us to be able to implement what the UN policy says on the right to the environment. And there's a lot of policy being developed on the UN approach, UN's common approach to pollution, UN common approach to biodiversity, and all of this 
now like we fully integrate right to healthy environment and before it was really difficult to actually say that and that's another beauty of having this right recognized as a uh, as an independent right on this so um so like we collaborate more and uh, we uh, we collaborate more and then uh, we achieve more because uh, we bring in our own expertise and own uh, uh, strength into this work so and then uh, it will also result in a better outcome at the country level, also the policy implementation wise. So I, I will try to keep this very short, but I, so this is one thing that I wanted to just mention, like what that means for the UN, but and uh, now I wanted to briefly introduce uh, our work at uh, partnership uh, work with the uh, URG and the uh, UNEP on the, the recommendations of the human rights treaty, bo treaty bodies and also UPR, Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council. And uh, to, one is that just the idea was to stock take, uh, have a stock taking on the, the global stock taking on this issue because uh, we talk about the right to the environment, the human rights environment, but what is out there and the, what are the recommendations that we've uh, we are able to gather from the two very important and actually like three, there's another, but we are still working on it. Two important uh, mechanisms on human rights. So UPR is a uh, is a uh, is is part of the uni um, the Human Rights Council, and uh, it uh, they meet, it finds all countries, uh, all member states of the UN to be reviewed every like three, four years on all human rights issues. So it doesn't matter that you're party to one treaty or two treaties or none, like you're actually, you have to be reviewed. And the countries are, uh, there's a peer review group and they give uh, recommendations to each other. So it's an intergovernmental process, which actually works pretty well in a sense that countries really hate to be uh, picked on <laughs> on a lot of issues. And the other is a human rights treaty body. So, uh, so we've had a treaty body member, like the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So the committee is, Committee members they review the, um, the human rights records of the scope of that treaty, such as uh, if it's uh, on the CRC, they review the child rights issues uh, in, on a given country every three four years. It depends on the cycle of the treaty bodies, and uh, so we review these uh, two uh, mechanisms uh, and uh, with uh, the environment related. Uh, issues in mind. And uh, without further ado, I just move on to the next uh, slide. So this is uh, for UPR. We uh, we've uh, and first of all, thanks so much. I I have to give all the credit to like uh, Joseph from URG and also Juliana Federico and the uh, Gavita from the uh, from UNEP. They've done all this work. I'm just they they put the uh, words in my mouth. I'm just repeating what they've done. So. <laughs> So the UPR, uh, so is uh, they've done a huge amount of work reviewing all the three cycles since uh, 2008. And for treaty bodies, they did a, a sample of th uh, 30 countries because it's just impossible to actually do like 103, uh, um, over 100 or, or uh, almost uh, 193 countries or 192. So it's uh, the period that we have reviewed. And uh, could you go to the next? So we found that actually, so out of a total uh, recommendation, UPR recommendations uh, from this period, it was uh, 90,936. And how many recommendations did we have related to the environment is 660. It looks like it's a lot, but it's only 1% of the recommendations. And second treaty bodies, you can also see uh, they reviewed uh, um, 5,000, uh, there were 5,100 recommendations from the select countries on the, uh, from select uh, treaty bodies. And the environment issues were covered in uh, 132 recommendations, which is slightly higher than the UPR, 3%. And how is that break, how is it broken down by the thematic issues is, as you can see, so we have, uh, we had different categories in analyzing this data. And first was by uh, the environmental issues, whether it was a climate change, biodiversity or pollution or other issues. And you can see there's an overwhelming number of uh, recommendations related to climate. So you can see how states take this issue as a uh, environment issues is like first come to their like priority is a uh, climate. So there are like 48 percentage of um, percentage of our recommendations were on climate change and followed by biodiversity and pollution. This also like um, confirms a lot of actually some uh, uh, 
uh, some experts of the UN, also the CSO, they actually talk about the you know, biodiversity and pollution is a sort of have become invisible area on human rights issues, which is actually true on the, uh, as you can see it on the data. And what about treaty bodies? They've also, we've uh, done the same methodology and we found that also there's also quite a lot of uh, concentration on the climate related recommendations, which is like 20, 6% and followed by uh, pollution and uh, biodiversity. Next, please. And uh, so, and uh, so, like today, we heard a lot of like speakers and uh, also commentators uh, talking about business issues. And this was also something that we are very keen to finding out more about because we wanted to clarify more about the business responsibility relating to the right to the environment. So what is, uh, how many recommendations do we have from the UPR, uh, UPR on the business? We had 140 and out of 140, and uh, we had uh, business uh, related the recommendations in general 64% and other extractives like 36%. And the reason why, in, uh, why we, we, why we are singled out extractive is because there were a lot of recommendations related to business on extractives. So this was a kind of, kind of also a finding for us to see actually that you will see like extractive is actually a huge issue for business matters related to the environment. And treaty bodies is the same. So it's similar, like there, uh, there were like out of like 72 number of recommendations we had, half was on general environment issues, but also like another half was almost about the extractive. So this is uh, quite interesting to see. It's really about extractives. A lot of attention is given to extractives. Next, please. And uh, so this was quite interesting. So we did a, a search for the wording, the right to help the environment. So not on the environmental issues in general, but it's really referencing the right to help the environment or clean healthy environment. And treaty bodies out of 132 uh, recommendations, there was zero reference to the right to help the environment, which is understandable because uh, the research period was before the recognition of the right to the environment. So, and the treaty bodies tend to actually be very legal, which is their job. So they don't want to refer to a right or they don't feel they need to create a new right. So that's why we think that was a zero uh, reference to that. And but UPR, you see uh, there are 15, um, which is still a small number, but that was quite surprising to see actually countries, even before the recognition, they're referencing the right to the environment explicit in the recommendations. Next, please. And uh, uh, this will be my last one. So like recommendations by uh, populations and groups, because we talk quite a lot about leaving no one behind and those who are vulnerable to environmental uh, uh, degradation, like more vulnerable such as women and indigenous peoples and, um, and uh, environmental human rights defenders and also children and youth. But children and youth, we couldn't find a lot of meaningful numbers. So we are actually omitting them. But you will see that it was positive result in a way that uh, there were like specific recommendations related to women, indigenous peoples, and also environmental defenders within the, the environment related recommendations. So I think the states are doing, and also treaty bodies are doing, paying, paying uh, quite a bit of attention on the people in the vulnerable situation on this. So next, please. That's it, right. Okay, so I will stop here. And this is just a, um, a teaser of uh, what we are preparing. So we are not actually, we are still in the progress of, um, in the process of reviewing this. And also what we are, um, what we are planning to do is have this data, but also backed by the case studies. So how does this good practice and the realization of the right to health environment look like on the ground? So we have um, select the case studies on this issue and the, uh, and also the data on the stock taking on the recommendations, which will, which we hope that will help for the country, a better country level implementation on this. So I'll stop here and then uh, pass it over back to Mark. Thank Thanks, you. So Young. I mean, we're, we're, as you mentioned, we're somewhat involved in this analysis, but it's still fascinating to see the results. And I predict that now the right to healthy environment has been recognized. Uh, by the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, you'll see an explosion in the next 10 years in the number of recommendations focused on the right to healthy environment. And for all civil society uh, people who are still here, it's an extra, we've, we've done a sim similar project with UNICEF on children's rights recommendations and UNFPA on sexual reproductive health right recommendations. And it's an extremely effective way 
to get influence with governments, uh, to submit information to the uh, UN human rights mechanisms, and then they submit recommendations to the state, and then the state really feels as though they, sh especially if it's the UPR, they should implement those um, recommendations. So we're past uh, the time that we had for, for Alfred to do closing remarks. Does anybody have any questions or comments uh, on the panel we've just heard? Yeah, yes. All right, thank you all for the informative and excellent interventions. So quick one on the environmental rights agreement. Uh, one of the issues that has been constantly coming up, even as we work towards um, the road to realizing uh, environmental binding environmental rights agreement in Africa, is uh, the channel to use to pursue this uh, uh, right. And um, we know that uh, at the national and international levels, uh, for us to get stronger agreements that will be impactful at the mm, regional, international, and even the national level in the long run, we need to have um, follow channels that are impactful at the top. So what I wanted to ask based on previous experiences, uh, when negotiating for such agreements that are binding at the regional and international level, which um, platform, either if it is to the AU or the UNEKE and something like that, which would be the best uh, road to follow to have this agreement uh, achieved in the long run? Thank you very much. Any other questions? Maybe take one more. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, I'm Renny Gift. Um, I'm a legal officer at the Law Division, and um, we're about to launch our um, status of climate litigation report tomorrow. And so far, we've been getting a lot of questions from the media, and I think that we've had to answer about the report. So I think it's a good opportunity to turn it back to some of the panelists today. And one of the questions is that the report noted that uh, only 2% of the um, climate litigation globally has been coming from Africa. And the question has been, um, what are some of the barriers? I know you mentioned some in your, um, in your intervention. Maybe this is both for, for you and Christine, depending on the time, but what are some of the barriers to, um, what are some of the reasons for this? I imagine there are some barriers and also how can this be, how can these barriers be removed in the future? Thank you. Two excellent questions, both directed somewhat at Christine. I don't know if Milka is still uh, in the still on, no. Okay, so Christine, it makes it easier. So, um, all eyes are on you. <laughs> um, so very quickly, we did a small study featuring four African countries: DRC, Ghana, Kenya, and and Uganda. And it's you can find it on the Access Initiative website. It's called the Road to Realizing Environmental Rights in Africa: Moving from Principles to Practice. And it offers quite a number of uh, findings there, including why uh, you would uh, find um, challenges in uh, exercise of environmental rights, irrespective of the fact that five countries out of 54 have the right to, to in, in their constitution. First and foremost, the issue flagged from that study is capacity, I mean, awareness, just people being aware they have this right. And if, if they're aware, um, issues to do with access to courts. Um, sometimes the courts are in very far flung um, localities from where uh, these violations are happening, that that is resources to mount constitutional, I mean, uh, environmental challenges uh, because it can be extremely um, expensive if you do not have any assistance from uh, civil society groups supporting you in your litigation. Um, and the third one actually comes from a sort of, um, it's, it's almost people not real, realizing um, that, you know, if they don't see the impact of environmental rights uh, from, 
on a day-to-day -day basis, they're not very motivated to follow them up. They don't see the connection between environmental right protection and the other rights, the right to food, the right to health, the right to livelihood so closely. So they are not really concerned about that right. They'd rather go for the issue of housing, the issue of food, water, without seeing that it's actually linked to the right to um, a clean and healthy environment. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that there, but you can get more information from this report. It has quite a bit of findings on that. The other issue is about what's the best road to take, uh, best route to agitate for a continental-wide uh, treaty on the right to a clean and healthy environment. I think what you take is from the learning from the international stage. Uh, and one of the things that came from what Mark said, not only having a serious civil society backing, having a country that is willing to bring this up uh, within um, you know, the Assembly of States, whether it's the African Union, um, having somebody who's pushing this agenda um, on your behalf, I think that's the best route. Because um, if we go to the regional bodies, they only mostly at trade pacts. So ECOWAS, East African community, all those will not be the best vehicle to bring together a human rights instrument. So I think, um, Tom, the best one would be the African Union, um, would be the best body to do this. But then you'd have to have willing countries to push this agenda with uh, numerous support from mm. uh, civil societies within the continent uh, to do this. Thank you very much. On the last point, I completely agree. I think the African Union is best, but you need a few champions. Yes, and that's the key lesson from the history of the right to health environment of the UN is every time we needed a state champion to step up, whether it was the Maldives at the beginning, then it was uh slovenia then it was switzerland and then costa rica and then costa rica again it just happened perfectly but i think we were very fortunate in that um but i think there are candidates in africa who could yeah. take it forward okay uh thank you all so much to all the panelists it was really fantastic uh, presentations um yeah, well, we should give a round of applause for the panelists and then we will pass over for last words and thoughts to Alfred Brownell, who's the executive director of Green Advocates. His words are usually final words or any words very inspiring. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, hopefully he's still with us. Uh, Alfred, over to you. Alfred, are you there? Can you say something? Yeah. Okay, well, you'll have to put it with my particularly uninspiring final words. No, but thanks so much. Thanks especially to UNEP for, for being here and organizing this with us in NYU. Um, you know, I remember one of the difficult things of the internet working in the, within, with the international community is we all operate in these silos, right? There's the environmental uh, policy community, especially in Nairobi, then there's the human rights community in Geneva, there's a different community in New York, uh, and it's often the, the different communities don't speak the same language and they definitely don't talk. I remember when we first tried to bring um, human rights to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Conference of Parties, everybody was super angry with the Maldives. I mean, the big emerging economies have explained why, because they were talking about the right to development. And as you were saying about common but differentiated responsibilities and historic responsibilities of Western, um, Western states. 
Um, but even, uh, and of course, the big developed countries hated it completely, um, bringing human rights to the climate change discussions because they're petrified about climate litigation. But even small island developing states and other small states uh, really didn't like it and start to get angry and shout at me. Uh, I remember in one meeting of the Alliance of Small Island States, and I couldn't understand why. And it was because they were climate change people. And they thought that their job was already complicated enough without adding another layer of complication by bringing human rights in. And they were worried, it turns out, especially those that still had the death penalty. Hello. We would... Ah, here we go. It worked perfectly. I just thought I would blabber along until you joined us, Alfred. I'll just finish my story and then, uh, then you can speak. Um, and so, yeah, the small island states, they didn't like it because they thought it was a way, human rights was a way to conditionalize climate finance. So any country that had the death penalty still would not be able to get climate funding. All of that is to say that there's this, you know, it's always interesting and somewhat difficult when the human rights community gets involved with the environment community and vice versa. So these kind of events, I love them because we all get together and share experiences. And Alfred, over to the real star of the show. I'm very glad you, it wouldn't have been the same meeting if you didn't have the final words. So I'm happy to give you the floor. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um, um, you know, grappling with technology, I did not realize that I was speaking to myself. I could see you, hear you, but it was, uh, I didn't know I was on until, you know, guys behind the scene kind of lectured me. And so, um, in the what, what, what do I have to say, you know, to URG, to the New York University and all of those who organized this panel and put together, you know, what an incredible panel, um, what an incredible um, resource that it has been. Um, so it's been very rewarding to sit down and really learn from the wisdom of all of these folks, um, you know, and what I would say, you know, wow, what a journey this ride has been on. But it is important to recognize sometimes the role played by small island states, you know, indigenous people in civil society. It was also interesting to see the balancing acts that have that from different states that influence the evolution of this right. The fear of spurring litigation from so-called developed countries and the impact that this right may have on the ability of states to develop, especially from emerging economies. But I think that is clear that even though about 160 countries have recognized this right, either in their constitution or legislation, there has been some concern as to whether most of these countries are not on the mission of greenwashing their constitutions and legislation. The jury, however, is out that citizens, civil society, and indigenous people are not just sitting down on their bike. They are taking advantage of these rights, recognizing their constitution, recognizing their legislation, and they are pushing the boundaries and the outer limit of this to ensure a form of recognition. Even though we are not there yet, scholars and academic researchers are not also sitting down as the scholarly literatures are lifting the bar on the pathway to the right being a matter of customary international law, even though the joining is staying on. Where are we going? Well, we need to respond to the balancing act, it is very clear that that is very much influencing the enforcement of this right. Despite what we've seen evolving out of the UN Human Rights Council, despite what we see evolving out of the UN General Assembly Resolution, despite what we see evolving out of regional human rights mechanism, despite what we see evolving out of existing countries, legislations and constitutions, it is very much clear that at the bottom of this process is the same fear that has influenced how this right will have evolved universally. So what are we talking about? Weak political will to reform environmental laws and policies, limited efforts to ensure environmental rights are accessible to citizens, and poorly resourced environmental agencies with insufficient capacity to enforce environmental rights, poor public awareness of environmental rights, and their different perspective on their propriety and utility. Limited community involvement in environmental decision making, including an inability to access formal justice mechanisms 
and poor access to information, especially in the medium and in languages they can understand. Poor coherence between sector policies, standardization of procedure for constructing citizens, local communities, and harmonization of texts. And as we say, significant needs to improve natural resource laws and policies and enforce environmental rights, including development of stronger protection for environmental and land rights defenders, whistleblowers, and more robust anti slap legislation. Now, overcoming these challenges and achieving sustainable and resilient development requires effective national systems able and willing to provide safeguards for people and the planet. Environmental rights can help spur this vision by providing a framework for environmental and climate justice, protection of rights, and participatory and inclusive processes. The opportunities with the growing demand from citizens, from indigenous people, and civil society that have allowed us to achieve this momentum at this level. Now is the time to deepen understanding and build momentum and around environmental rights as a pathway to just transition and improve environmental governance. What are we talking about? We have seen both Alhus and now the conference of the parties of the Escaso Agreement taking place and gaining widespread attention globally. To see this opportunity, we've seen how different regions are now looking at trying to adapt and even replicate the Escaso. We've seen some effort in Southeast Asia, we've seen some effort in, in Africa. And I will speak more about the African process because this is something that I'm very much aligned with. Um, over the last uh, two and a half years, a growing body of civil society network have been organizing and campaigning to try to put in place an African environmental legal rights frameworks. And what that is about, the idea is trying to first raise the profile and visibility of environmental rights in Africa by building a clear and compelling narrative that all lines have environmental rights as essential condition for a just transition from Africa by aligning social and economic development with effective protection. We've also been involved in trying to identify government champions and build political interests. Because as you know, we've learned from how the balancing of interests affect the evolution of this right. So the attempt is to shift incentive and build consensus toward a sustained commitment for environmental rights objectives. We're also trying to strengthen civil society coalition and leverage the bottom-up network to both advocate for binding agreements in different African sub-regions and call for strengthening environmental rights for the protection of environmental defenders, indigenous people, communities that have been marginalized or made vulnerable. Then we are also trying to focus on how do we advance the research, advance research to support the advocacy by collecting new data from more African countries and broadening the baseline assessment on gaps in implementation. The incentive will also focus on leveraging the research initiative to mobilize key actors, such as academic institutions and research organizations, and define sub regional level steps as well as how to build this process. So, in moving forward, our idea is now to work on the regional plan for implementation, expand and strengthen the involvement of civil society, the leading development processes here and there. And so, this has been sort of a very worthy conversation that we have had. And we believe that the prospect for advancing environmental rights is there because citizens are very mobilized, they are energized. This right will not have gotten where it has been if there has not been the involvement of civil society, it's not been involvement of indigenous people, there's not been involvement of small island states, but also government champions, as you can see this evolving. As we close on this, it is interesting to note that currently a number of processes are evolving globally. We've seen the effort by the government of Vanuatu to get referral from the UN General Assembly to advance a petition on the human rights obligations of government to respond to the climate crisis. That petition is now before the International Court of Justice. We've also seen efforts in South America between Colombia and Chile to advance similar petition before the Inter-American Court. We've also seen effort by small island states to advance this right before the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea. And across the African continent, civil society are also organizing to advance similar right. It is very clear that, that citizens, 
public interest lawyers, activists, different stakeholders, even government are trying to make sure that this law and the rights to a healthy environment is something that will achieve international recognition by its enforcement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alfred. Wonderful summing up, but also, as always, fascinating look ahead. And especially, I like this folk. The more I hear about this African uh, treaty on environmental rights, the more I like it. I think it would send such a wonderful message uh, to the world. And I agree with you. I think the time is now. I think there is an appetite, uh, certainly amongst the populations, the citizens. But uh, you know, you need a bit of luck, you're right, to find one or two ch state champions, but there are there. I mean, at the moment at the Human Rights Council, Malawi is playing a fantastic role uh, at the Human Rights Council. Gambia is playing a fantastic role. Uh, so, you know, it just needs a bit of luck and a perseverance, which I'm sure you will provide. So thank you to everybody for staying with us half an hour over time. And I... Unless any so young, you have anything else to say, I will declare the meeting over. So thanks a lot. And thanks again, Alfred.